Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11 and the Thelius Boeing 747-200. This is part 3 of the video series, and today we're going to take a look at the INS system and how to update the INS position using the DME system. We've reached the top of climb now, cruising at uh, flight level 300, routing out over the Irish Sea, overhead Liverpool, on towards the Isle of Man, and then Belfast and the Oceanic Transitions. Before we look at what's happening in the flight deck, it's important to remember some INS theory. So let's have a brief recap of that, and then we'll get back into the aircraft in just a second. Okay, so here we are looking at a representation of the INS system. I must apologise, my drawings are not exactly to scale. And what we've got in the middle is a representation of the aircraft itself. We've got INS position 1, position 2, and position 3. And you can see that they've deviated slightly or drifted slightly from the aircraft position. Now it's important to understand the INSs themselves do not know that they're drifting because they don't have any uh, connection to the outside world. They just sense motion and work out where they think they are. So INS1 thinks it's in the correct location, INS2 thinks it's in the correct location, and INS3 thinks it's in the correct location. If we give them some outside stimulus, we snap our fingers and say, okay INSs, you're here. They can work out that, actually, I already thought I was here, that means I must be here instead. So they apply a correction vector. And this is a very important concept, that when you're correcting an INS unit, you are not dragging its own position back to the center. You are telling it to store a correction vector. Because the INS itself, if you try and move the position, you basically upset the whole concept of how the INS works. So they store a correction vector. So you can see here, all three INSs have got their own correction vector. Now this is how modern inertial reference systems work. They take the uh, position from, for example, the GPS system and use that to build correction vectors individually. The thing about the GPS system is it's continually available for the aircraft. So the correction vectors are kept up to date every cycle. Whereas on the carousel, when you're not DME updating, or if you've been a couple of minutes since you lasted a position update, they'll start to drift apart. And what happens is the IRs continue to drift just like they always would, but rather than having the correction vectors revised by the GPS systems, the correction vectors are static and they drift with the INS. So if you ask INS number one for the navigation position, it's going to say, I'm here. INS number two is going to say, I'm here. And INS number three is going to say, I'm here. But in isolation, they all think they're in the correct location. So what we have to do is to get a slightly better position out of the system. And we do that by enabling a function called triple mix. And that allows all three INSs to work together and to provide an average position output. So despite the errors and the static correction vectors, the correction vectors that haven't been updated, triple mix allows that position to be brought closer to the, the actual real position. And I'll say it again, it's important to realize the IRs individually have no concept of what the real position is. They're just giving you their, their best estimate, their, their best position source based on the information that they have sensed. If we get the opportunity to update the INSs directly from a ground source, again, like a DME or a position fix, then the correction vectors can be updated and the triple mix becomes redundant. So triple mix is like one level below uh, radio position fix. And that's what we're going to look at next, is how you actually tell the INSEs where they are with reference to a ground source. So this here is the symbol for a VOR DME. It's important to understand now it's only the distance that matters, it's only the distance that is used. The VOR aspect is completely irrelevant. Around the world at the moment, lots of via, uh, VORs are being withdrawn because they simply aren't used for major navigation work anymore. 
but the DMEs are still quite relevant because the DMEs still keep airliner FMSs up to date to this very day. You know, there's, there's aircraft out there that aren't GPS fitted and they use the DME. The DME is the square box in the symbol and the hexagon is the VOR. So if you see a square box on the chart, it's a DME only and there's, there'll be more and more of those in the coming years. It's important to understand the system has no concept of the radial or the bearing. It's just the distance. So the aircraft radio knows without any error that it is 50 miles away from the DME. What we do is we tell the INS system the known location of that DME transceiver assembly. The INS works it out and says, well, based on where I am, the DME station should be 52 miles away. As a result, the aircraft tells it it's actually only 50 miles away and the INS is able to update the correction vectors so that it moves it maybe two miles closer. And all is well. You're going to say to me now though, but you said there was no bearing information. Is it just a coincidence that it's a straight line between the aircraft and the INS position? Well, it is a little bit of a cheat because it's much more likely that it'll be laterally offset. You know, the drift is quite random on some of the units. So how will it fix this situation? Well, the INS is not aware of the true position. The only information it has is the 50 miles and it knows roughly the bearing from where it thinks it is to the DME. So it applies the two mile correction back towards the DME from the known or from the assumed position from the INS position. So now you've got the real aircraft position here and the INS thinks it's over here. That's not ideal. But fortunately, aircraft fly by moving forwards in flight. So when you're updating from a single DME source, you need the forward motion of the aircraft because as the aircraft moves forward, the INS navigation position moves forward as well. And as it sweeps through this arc of 90 degrees, i.e. the DME station uh, is uh, there's like a 90 degree transit in the, uh, the bearing towards the DME station, there will come a point that the uh, correction has been applied in both axes. And it will come in and it will update the position quite precisely. So with a single DME update, you need the passage of time. You'll also note that it's simply distance based. It's not radial based. So you could have the same distances indicated on the other side. That's why it's important that when you're choosing a DME station to update from, it's more than 35 miles cross track because the maximum drift you'd expect to see in the uh, inertial system is less than that over the flight, the course of the flight. So by making sure it's 35 miles at least cross track, you won't have any likelihood of being on the wrong side of the DME station. Now, of course, if you've got two DME stations, it's a lot easier. In one single instant, by calculating the two, uh, by knowing the position of the two stations and getting the distances from both stations, the computers can work out, well, I'm either here or here. And then a second or so later, if this distance here has reduced and this distance here has remained the same, then the aircraft was at this location flying forwards. And yet if this distance here has increased, it must have been this location here. So a dual DME position update is much quicker and much more accurate. And that's how modern aircraft do it. They're not Currently, our modern aircraft don't use a single DME update typically. They can use a VOR DME update, but the carousel is either single DME or dual DME. And the dual DME is a lot more precise. So let's have a look at our route now. We were overhead Wallasey, routing for the Isle of Man, and then Belfast, and then out towards the oceanic transitions. Wallasey, Isle of Man, and Belfast are all four DMEs. But if we apply the update, if we use those uh, DMEs for the updating process, you're going to end up with the error all the way along the track. And you're going to have cross-track error introduced because it's not very precise at these small angles. It would actually be worse than just leaving it alone. 
So updating from a VOR on track using DME updating is a bad idea with the carousel. Instead, we're going to use Dublin and Tyree. Because when we use Dublin and Tyree, we get a good 90 degree sweep. So you can see reading from Dublin, we'll get east-west corrections at this point. We'll get north-south corrections at this point. And Tyree, we'll get north-south corrections here and east-west corrections here. And in both cases, they're far enough cross track that the aircraft is not likely to end up on the opposite side of the DME station flying a parallel track. If I was using the Isle of Man and I was maybe only a mile cross track, well, it could be a mile that side, a mile that side, and the math would still work and the system would get more lost. I hope that makes sense. Let's jump back into aircraft and see how we can use that information practically. Okay, so here we are, back in the airplane, just turning overhead Wallace. As I said before, we're up at flight level 300 and uh, in the cruise. What we have to do, first of all, is look at the configuration on the INS systems. Now, I haven't set these INSs to do a triple mix. You can tell that by looking at the desired track status page. The last digit is 5, indicating that they are in standalone mode or isolated mode. Normally, you'd command them into triple mix mode on the ground. But for this video, I thought it was more important to leave the triple mix setting until we got airborne and could have a, a chat about what triple mix actually meant. It's not just triple mix. What you're actually enabling the INS to do when you uh, up mode to mode 4, you push 4 and insert it goes into mode 4 here. You have to do that on all of the units. What you're actually doing is telling it to go into assisted or augmented navigation mode. It will triple mix now if it can't do anything better. But if you give it a DME station, it will now update from the DME station. Something to be clear about is when we're doing the DME updating, you've got the number one nav radio the number one INS, and you've got the updating lights one and two. You don't need to update both INSs off the one station. In fact, that would be counterproductive. The two separate DME capabilities are so that you can do dual DME updating, which is a different mode, as we've just seen. So when I update number one, we'll do number one from Dublin. This unit here will control the update it will send the corrected position across the network between the three devices, the three computers, and they will derive their own corrections. So even though you're only updating number one with the light here, it will still position correct the other three units. And that's important because when it comes out of DME updating, it goes back into triple mix. And it would be a bit useless if all we've done is correct this position's location so that we come back out of DME updating and then instantly number two and number three put a lot of error back on the navigation solution. So Dublin. On my flight plan here I've got the lat lawns and the information we need for DME updating. You can grab this information off Sky Vector. You also need the elevation in thousands of feet. You can get that from a number of different websites. I want to tune Dublin on 114.9 in fact, we've got that already tuned. That's a coincidence. You see the DME is counting down. If I listen to the ident, that's dub. And that's another station further off in the distance. But Dublin is the predominant station. If we put the VOR marker on here, we can see it's pointing roughly in the correct location. So I'm confident that is Dublin. Now we have to tell the DME to update. Now you can remote DME waypoints between the two units, but I haven't found a practical reason for doing that because really I'm only ever wanting Dublin on this one box. This will control the update and the other devices will receive it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to waypoint mode. Notice when I'm in waypoint, the normal waypoint, it's showing me from waypoint four to waypoint five. On the real thing, I'd push 9 and 7 together. 
in this case, push and hold on 9 and then push 7 and that puts you into DME lat lawn mode. Notice there's a single digit in this, the display now. So I put the Dublin coordinates in, I say it's north, 53, 29, 9, insert, and west, 6, 1, 8, 4, insert. I also have to tell it the DME frequency, so again, long push on 9, click on 3, it's the frequency and the elevation. So for elevation, I just think of north as being up, so north, in this case, it's only a couple of hundred feet at Dublin, um, so we'll just say zero because this is thousands of feet. Insert, and then we'll push the east button, and in this side we'll put the frequency 11490. Notice the decimal place is in the wrong position, that's just a, a function of the carousel, that's quite natural for it. And insert. So the system now knows all about the DME station. It hasn't actually started the update though we can see that it's still saying waypoint zero. With it still being in DME mode, I'll flick it over to distance time. It's now showing me the computed distance to the DME station and the aircraft is showing me the actual distance to the DME station. These look fairly reasonable. So I'm going to do a waypoint change, one, check the distance again and insert. It will come to life. INS one updating light comes on and you see the aircraft has updated its position corrections and it's now moving to reduce this value or make this value match here. So when it's on course, the two values should be the same. And because we've got a co-located VOR, we can see that it's we're just coming into that sweep. We'll have a good 90 degree sweep of the Dublin uh, uh, DME station. So that's single DME updating, and it'll update its position quite happily. We can look on the map momentarily and see that actually, yes, it has corrected. We're supposed to be flying Lima 10, and it's correcting nicely towards Lima 10. So how about we do dual DME updating so we get a good fix from Tyree as well? Well, the first thing is, can we actually hear Tyree? It's on 117.7. 117.7. There's a distance indicator. There's a bearing pointer because it's got a VOR, but remember, you don't necessarily need a VOR. That's just some good situational awareness. Listen for TIR, so it's dash, dot, dot, is T and I. That's TIR, so it's solid uh, TIR reception. And what we'll do for dual mode is obviously number one's busy with Dublin, so I'll go into waypoints here. I'll put it into DME mode, so long press on 9, short press on 7. I could recycle position number 1. Obviously I could remote the waypoints across, in which case position 1 would be Dublin. I haven't found any benefit for doing that, but just for neatness let's use waypoint 2. It's blank anyway, and we'll say it's uh, north, 56, 29, 6, insert, and west, 6, 52, Five. insert, long press on 9, frequency, north, the elevation is 0, so we'll just put that in, and uh, east frequency 11770, insert. Go to distance time, it's still in DME mode, and just cross check that the distance that FMS is computing to Tyree is similar to the DME distance. With that, the final stage, as I said before, we have to do waypoint change and then tell it which station to update from. So, waypoint change, two, check the distance, it matches, insert, and we get dual DME updating. And now it's doing the radius of position check, so it should be a lot more accurate in dual DME updating mode. And that's pretty much it for DME updating. It's all good, it's navigating, it's keeping itself up to date, and we shouldn't have any further issues with the accuracy. What I will say at this point is there are still some tiny little issues with how the DME updating works on the aircraft. There's some uh, refinements that could be made to it. So keep an eye on what it's doing and make sure you stick rigidly to the procedures and you should have very few issues with DME updating. I find it's best not to update at extreme range 
and if the DME is directly ahead of you, which you'll know by your flight plan, then maybe leave it until it's uh, passing a beam the aircraft. You can see here, the aircraft is, as far as x plane's concerned, more or less perfectly on track. One other thing of interest is the use of the third INS here. I want to know how far ahead waypoint number 9 is from my current position. If I flick the uh, selector outside of waypoint and distance time, it resets from DME mode to normal mode. You can see there's two digits displayed now, and distance matches the distance to goal and not the distance to DME station. So you, re you bring it out of DME mode by choosing something other than waypoint and distance time. What I want to see is the distance to the end waypoint, the last waypoint I've got loaded. I can't do it on here, although I can do, for example, waypoint change 7 and 8, and that will tell me the distance between 7 and 8 without inserting it. If I do waypoint change 0 and 9, it doesn't update the position of 9, uh, of 0, sorry, it doesn't update that position until I insert it. And I don't want to do that because that would change the navigation on the aircraft. But fortunately, I've got INS number three down here. I can just go to distance time. In fact, let's go to waypoint first of all. Check that waypoint nine is still 59 north, 30 west. And then just do waypoint change, zero, nine, insert. And now it tells me it's 860 miles to go or just over an hour and a half. So from the set of coordinates that we loaded, leaving Heathrow, uh, that's that's almost two hours worth of flying, maybe even a little bit more. We left the stand an hour ago. So yeah, we've got about two and a half hours before we have to update the second set of coordinates. So although you've only got nine waypoints, it's not quite as limited as you might first expect. Last thing we can do, having finished with that, is just do waypoint change five, six again, back to insert and it should uh, come back in, in line with what we've got here. So INS number one is always connected to autopilot number one. INS number two is always connected to autopilot number two. So in the INS mode here, it's always number one for one and number two for two. You do have the ability down here to change which INS is displayed. So if waypoint, uh, sorry, if INS three was doing direct to the end, as we did previously. We can have a look at it on here, see which way to go. But notice the autopilot still stays wings level following INS1. This is simply changing what's presented on the HSI. If you ever find yourself having to fly with only INS3, put it on the HSI and then just follow it using the heading bug. I'll reset that to waypoint change, five, six, insert, and then we're back to normal operations. I hope all that makes sense. In the next video, we'll be having a look at the fuel system and how to manage the fuel to make sure you don't run out of fuel on your transatlantic crossing. I hope you join me for that video. Thanks very much for watching, and uh, as always, do double check the video description to check for any errors, omissions, and corrections that uh, I may find later after recording the video. Thanks very much.